Welcome to the Unfrazzled Entrepreneur Podcast. I uh, hope you're having a blessed day. My name is Steven. I'm here with my good friend and co-host, Ryan. Ryan, how are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> well, last episode, we talked about our journey and it just got me thinking. I wanted to yeah. go a little bit deeper and have a conversation on just like the success path and becoming an unfrazzled entrepreneur. Yeah. I feel like I'm still in this frazzled state. Sure. So I want to be able to ask you questions uh -huh. and become a be able to turn my crazy entrepreneur, like making a lot of money, not making any money to a more consistent right. MRR. I feel yes. like you are my uh, mentor in this. And I just want to be able to uh, ask you questions M about MRR that. So, means what? Oh, monthly reoccurring revenue. <laughs> yes, exactly. Because if you said we have a lot of people probably that'll like watch certain episodes and be like, Ooh, they might not uh, any terminology we've used in the past. So we got to let them know monthly recurring revenue guys. That's where it's at. I know that you are constantly helping people. I know you've uh -huh. launched successful memberships. Is there something that you see from someone like me that's in a frazzled state, maybe patterns as you're helping people to mm -hmm. see and go, ooh, here's a success path that I think this coming from yeah. a frazzled state to unfrazzled, here are some common things and some patterns that I see that most people do these, they're yeah. able to move from frazzled into unfrazzled. Sure. Well, as you know, when you start a business, you usually start as a solopreneur and you're doing all of it. You're doing everything. Now, I know when you, you started your first um, but when you and Nathaniel were doing it, you, you kind of already had a team built in and that's unusual, but mm -hmm. most people start off with, Hey, I'm, I just quit my job or I'm starting this new thing and I'm solo and you wear every single hat. And our, our analogy of the office building, you know, with, uh, you know, one level being customer service another floor being like marketing department, another floor might be the accounting department. The other floor be the executive department where the, you know, the boss is up at the top and, you're literally running up and down the stairs all day long. And um, that's, can that can get you frazzled pretty quickly. And so you kind of, it, and it's even the same with people who have Amazon businesses. I, I know Jimmy Smith mentioned many times that he and his wife, Brittany, they would hit a ceiling. They, they could not get past a certain number. And it was just because they didn't have any more time. There's only 24 hours in a day and they just could not do anymore uh, with the current time that they have and the current restraints that they had. And so they had to hire a team. They had to go to a prep center do something to hire a shopper, do something different that freed up their time. And so, yes, there, there is that pattern. And it was in my, when our furniture business, I remember it clearly when I was, but at first it's exciting. You're okay running up and down all those stairs because especially if you just quit and you're, you've just quit your job, it's, you got the freedom that you now can, you know, you decide what stairs you're going to go on and what, at what point. And so you do have that freedom, but fairly quickly, um, I mean, maybe a year or two in, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, I'm getting tired of running up these stairs. I feel like I've just created another job for myself. Yes, it's my own company, but it feels like you've bought yourself another job. And so, yeah, everybody comes, if you, when your business grows, there is a point where you're like, I can't do this anymore. If I'm going to continue to grow, if you're okay, if you're okay there and you enjoy, you're you're in really good shape and you can go up and down all those stairs all the time. Maybe you even build elevators, um, and now you're just going up and down the elevators, and you're still a solopreneur. Some people stay there, but if you want to grow, you've got to go to that next level, and that is usually adding a team. Um, and that doesn't mean like you know thousands and thousands of dollars of expense. It could be you know a virtual assistant. It could be a piece of software that changes the game for you. It could be one little hire or one thing that you outsource that frees up that time that you allows you to go to that next level. And so they're naturally, every person has a business you're going to, and we think about, I love your analogy of the office building is perfect. There's going to be one level of that office building that you really enjoy over the others. And you're like, gosh, I wish I could spend all my time here in this department because that's the one I really enjoy. But I have a business. I have to do all of them in order for this business to run. It's the example of the E-Myth um, book that we talked about before with the cupcake baker who's really good at making cupcakes. And they, they make awesome cupcakes. Everybody loves them. So they decide they want to start a business. Then they get into business and they realize, oh my gosh, there's so much more to a cupcake business and then just making really good cupcakes. Now they have all the, you know, the accounting, and marketing, the bookkeeping, exactly. Marketing, the marketing department. <laughs> like I didn't sign up for this. I just want to make cupcakes. I know people like them and I want to sell them. That's it. And so 
um, you you typically find that there's a certain certain floor that you really you enjoy that you're good at, and that's what we would call our you know kind of our zone of genius, or at least that's the area we want to spend more time in. But in order to have a business run, you have all those floors that have to be running, and so either you can continue running up and down the stairs, build some elevators to make it faster, or you find people to plug into those floors so that you can kind of just oversee it. Um, and, I think uh, and spend more time where was, you want to be spending. Exactly. The unfrazzled state is not necessarily a monetary amount. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. like once you do this, then you're unfrazzled. It's really up to you and what your passion and desire is. And like you said, you have the choice. You can build this thing and go to the next level if you're uncomfortable in that first level. But if you're in that first level and you have everything and you're unfrazzled, you can stay there. There's no you have to go to this next level. It's up to you to pick where your unfrazzled and your passion is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I heard this from Dan Miller, but somebody else wrote this. Um, so here it's a, a, I'll just read this out. Uh, an American investment banker was at the pier of a small coastal Mexican village when a small boat with just one fisherman docked inside the small boat were several large yellow fin tuna. The American complimented the Mexican on the quality of his fish and asked how long it took to catch them. The Mexican replied only a little while. The American then asked, why didn't he stay out longer and catch more fish? The Mexican said he had enough to support his family's immediate needs. The American then asked, but what do you do with the rest of your time? He said, I sleep late, fish, fish a little, play with my children, take siestas with my wife, Maria, stroll into the village each evening where I sip wine and play guitar with my amigos. I have a full and busy life. The American scoffed. I'm a Harvard MBA and I can help you. You should spend more time fishing and with the proceeds buy a bigger boat. With the proceeds from the bigger boat, you could buy several boats, several boats. Eventually, you would have a fleet of fishing boats. Instead of selling your catch to middlemen, you would sell directly to the processor, eventually op operating your own cannery. You would control the product, processing, and distribution. You would need to leave this small coastal fishing village and move to Mexico City, then LA, and eventually New York City, where you will run your expanding enterprise. The Mexican fisherman asked, but how long will this all take? The American replied, 15 to 20 years. And then Mexican says, but what then? The American laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is right, you would announce an IPO and sell your company stock to the public and become very rich. You would make millions. Okay, and the Mexican says, millions, then what? The American said, then you would retire, move to a small coastal fishing village where you would sleep late, fish a little, <laughs> play with your kids, take siestas with your wife, stroll to the village at evening where you could sip wine and play your guitar with your amigos. It's that cycle. I think in this success path, there is different steps, but the pain point is I think what pushes you to the next. If you mm -hmm. don't have that pain point and you enjoy being a solo entrepreneur, yeah, then you can do that. I did not. That's why right. I wanted to grow and started to grow a team. Yeah, Took on a little too many projects. So I feel like I've been unfrazzled and gone back to frazzled. And I think this mm -hmm. roller coaster that I'm on, reading the e-myth helped me understand like I'm an entrepreneur. I like to build. But the problem mm -hmm. is I should be bolting those pieces onto my business, not yeah. just bouncing to the next thing. I'd love to light the fire and go, I'm on to the next. I'm going to build something else. That process I enjoy, yeah. but it's not a consistent business because as I get older and have to continue to restart, that's when the profits drop and then my mm -hmm. wife gets nervous. So I think that story is a perfect vision of the unfrazzled can be at different positions. It's what totally. do you enjoy? Like you said, what floor do you want to be mm -hmm. on? Where do you want to stay? What is your... This is another concept that you told me about desired zone. And I think I'll, I'll actually bring up that picture while you talk about it. But yeah, sure. this concept of the desired zone was extremely helpful to me to go, I want to become unfrazzled, but I think first I got to figure out what is it that I like to do? What am I both mm -hmm. passionate and proficient about? I mean, I originally heard all this um, from my friend Dan Miller again, but he got it from a book called The Big Leap. Um, authors, uh, Gay Hendricks, and there's the zone of incompetence, the zone of in, so the zone of incompetence, con, then the zone of competence, the zone of excellence, and then the zone of genius. I really like what Michael Hyatt has here. And so for those of you listening, we'll put a link in the show notes to this uh, graphic, but it's called the freedom compass. And this come from, comes from Michael Hyatt's book. Um, the, uh, I might even be in free, free to focus as well, but it's also in his, uh, your world class executive assistant. And so He's talking about there's just the different zones of your work and the the desire zone being your zone of genius, as Gay Hendricks would say. That's the place where you, that's the work that you love, you're good at. 
And you, you could do that, that you want to spend most of your time there. And the goal is to get, you know, obviously the ideal goal would be to spend hundred percent of your time in that desire zone. <laughs> Not very likely, most like, I mean, just practically. Um, and then you've got the disinterest zone, then the, uh, bring that up. Sorry, I bring that back up. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> disinterest zone, the distraction zone and the drudgery zone. And so everybody understands what the drudgery zone is. Of course, these are tasks that you're not, you're not good at and you don't even like to do. Um, that is going to be where you're going to start outsourcing some of those tasks. For me, that would be like the accounting and the bookkeeping part of a business, a very crucial part of the business, but not something I enjoy and just not, I mean, I guess I could do it. Um, not worth my time, not a good use of my time at all. And so find those things and we'll have a download eventually, I think that has, um, and maybe even by the time this podcast airs, a, a, a kind of like a worksheet that you can list all the tasks that you do in your business and put what zone is it in? Is it, is this my desire zone? Is this my distraction zone where you're not really that good at it, but something you enjoy or a disinterest zone where you're, you're kind of, you're kind of good at it, but you're not really passionate about it. Um, where does those tasks lie? And then especially because you may not want to outsource everything all at once. You might want to just kind of baby step your way into this. Maybe there's a piece of software that can help you even, but what are some of those tasks that you can get rid of, especially in that drudgery zone, that, which is just going to completely like be a huge relief off of you. Like, wow, I don't really have to go to that floor as much anymore. I can kind of check in on it, make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing there. But now that frees me up to spend even more time in my zone of genius and you're not, it's not going to feel like work, really. You'll be like, wow, this is, it, it, it'll be like a weight off your shoulders, honestly. We talked about this a little bit in the first episode. It's almost easier to identify those things in the drudgery zone. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to do them, but sure. it's a quick thing to go. We talked about the pool pump. You said, oh, that's in my drudgery zone. I would never even attempt to do that. Right. But because it was proficient for me, but it mm -hmm. wasn't a passion, that's kind mm -hmm. of where I get a little sucked in is on both of those sides yeah. of that sure. visual. It's interesting though, when you have that clear indicator and you hand it off and that stress that you feel comes off of you, it uh -huh. happens on both sides of that equation. Sure. But I think because I'm always seen myself of a jack of all trades, master of none. And now mm -hmm. I'm trying to go, oh, I see if you become a master of something, you can get really good at it and just stay mm -hmm. in that proficiency zone, that desired yes. zone. But the passion piece is always like, I enjoy and am passionate about helping people. And I think mm -hmm. the passion and non-passion switches very quickly. Mm -hmm. So when I'm helping somebody do something, I'm very passionate about it, but then it turns into, they don't have the time to do it. So then I pick it up as a job. And then it turns into something that I'm, I'm disinterested in. And right. it's just taking a lot of time. But then as I'm getting mm -hmm. older and handing those things off, it has that same feeling of these things that used to be in the drudgery zone, yes. the lifted weight off the shoulder and getting excited mm -hmm. again to go back into that desired zone. Another way to make this help, help easier, make it easier. If somebody's, um, you know, more analytical and you understand numbers, just think about what is your hourly rate. And maybe for some reason, people, this doesn't mean anything, but for those of you that are more, you know, numbers minded, you'll get this and then it'll, it'll help you start getting rid of tasks that you don't need to be doing to be that pool pump example. So let's say that I was just, I, I could totally do that. And I'm actually not bad at all with fixing my pool pump. Don't have a pool, but say I had a pool, had a pool pump that breaks something I could totally do. <clears throat> let's say that's going to take me two hours to do. Um, now a professional is probably going to do it faster. A professional will do it for $150. And let's say in my hourly, I, I know, you know, hourly wage is let's say it's $150 an hour. So that's $300 of my time spent fixing that pool pump and two hours of my two hours of my time, which equates to $300 is what that cost me to get that done or hire it for 150 and not have to think about it. So do that math too. For some people, they enjoy mowing the lawn. That's a, I think we might've mentioned this. That's a, something that is like healing to them. Like they get on a lawnmower and I have, they can just be thinking or listen to a podcast, but do that recognizing just recognizing how much your time is worth and, and maybe it's worth it to you to kind of just check out and be able to just to sit and think that's cool but if it's feel if you feel like i really don't want to be doing this it's got to get done anyway i'm going to go do it it may help you talk to your spouse and say hey I, you know what i don't enjoy this task i know it needs to get done but i want to hire that out because i can get it done for 50 and my time's a hundred dollars an hour so 
do you want me to spend a hundred dollars on that or pay 50 for it? So just, uh, just be aware, be aware of what you're doing when you're doing a task and you're not, you're, you're not enjoying it. Write that thing, write that thing down and think, okay, what am I going to do? So I don't have to do this ever again. I think that's what step am I going to take to not have to do this task ever again. I think that's an excellent practice of writing the stuff down because I think when we talked a couple of weeks ago, it was like the things that are not the drudgery zone, but on the sides, Mm -hmm. I find myself just becoming complacent in those, like say mowing Mm -hmm. the grass is something that I'm proficient at, but I don't enjoy. It's not a desire zone. It's just taking up time and my time would be spent better doing something else, Mm -hmm. but I don't recognize it in the moment. It's almost like I have to, at the end of the day or at the end of the task, just write it down and go, is this in my desire zone? It's like a self check as I'm going through those tasks. I think as an entrepreneur, it's, maybe a little bit easier because you're like, now I have to do the marketing. That's why I love the floor analogy is like, what mm-hmm. task and job are you doing in what floor? Just recognize it, identify yeah. it, and then qualify yeah. it. Is this in your desired zone? Right. Is this drudgery? Is it something that you're proficient at mm-hmm. or pa- passionate? Like it's, mm-hmm. it just helps you qualify that task and then helps you streamline and spend more time in that desired zone. Mm-hmm. I enjoy painting. I enjoy yeah. mudding at times, but I enjoy doing them at a certain time say I'm working on my business and I'm just like, I, I can't think this through. I need to go physically do something to kind of think through this. I enjoy mm-hmm. doing certain rehab <laughs> skills and tasks when I have a lot mm-hmm. of stuff on my mind, because it just gives me a mindless thing. I've, I've painted my whole life. My dad was a painter on the side. Mudding is something I've done my whole life. So it's, it's a natural groove that I can get back mm-hmm. in and then mm-hmm. clear my mind mentally while I'm physically doing something to focus in on that then I stop and take pictures of myself and like, Brian, I'm working, but I had this great idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I think there will be things that it might seem a little odd that you're like, I do, I am passionate about cutting the grass. I am proficient at this. Mm-hmm. It might be that it's giving you a time to think it, it's giving you the passion and enjoyment or just relaxation when you need to take a break. It, right. I, I don't think they have to be so cut and dry, but just sure. taking note, writing that stuff down, I think is a yeah. huge benefit. You can just do it consciously. Business. I know I'm on the lawn. I know I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> uh, but just realizing that, yeah, I'm doing this, but soon I'm not going to have to do this. Um, yeah, just don't get in the rut of just doing things like you used to. You're in business now and you want to grow your business. You got to do things differently. And I think some of those tasks that are get people stuck is those things that only take two minutes to do, five yes. minutes to do, 10 minutes to do. Well, you know what? I'm going to have to pay somebody or I'm going to have to train somebody how to do this. It's going to take me an hour to train them. I might as well just do this. It takes me three minutes. I'm pretty fast at it. But think about how many times you do that three minute task, get somebody trained. Like I literally just, you know, this last week, there's been something on my to-do list to outsource that I just, it's silly, but it took me that, it took me months to finally get to a place where I was tired of doing it. Like, okay, enough. I don't want to do this anymore. It's just something pretty quick that I can do, but I know while I'm doing it, a VA should be doing this. I should not be doing this. And here I am doing it anyway, but I had it on my list and I finally got it outsourced. And so um, just do it consciously, you know, just you think, think as you're doing that, have, have the, write it down and be like, okay, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. That's it. For you. Do you think it gets easier to identify those tasks that a VA or somebody else should be doing? Yeah. As you go along for sure. Yeah. Cause at the beginning you might like think, you know, could a VA even do this? Like I'm having coffee right after we get off this podcast with somebody that wants to know what something, what a VA could do in their business. And so they don't know exactly everything that they could be outsourcing. So yeah, absolutely. But as, so as you go along, you talk to other business owners, you see what they're outsourcing. You look what their schedule's like, like, wow, I'd love to get to that level where I'm, that's my business or my time looks like that right there. So yeah, you, as you go, but guys, pretty much, I mean, literally it's, I would be hard pressed to find something that a VA couldn't do. If you have a podcast, a VA is not going to do a podcast for you. They're not going to be public speakers for you. They're not going to be. They might be able to write your blog for you potentially, but you're going to do the things that move the needle the biggest and the most, all the other administrative stuff, pretty much any admin task a VA could, does that mean you should outsource all of it all at once? No, it's just like somebody in an Amazon business. You kind of tiptoe into this. You hire out the prep and ship, or you hire a shopper and you, you try that out. And I understand the the temptation to be scared. Like it's going to cost me to bring this person on. Yes, it is a cost, but actually, if you look, flip it around, it's actually, it's actually not a cost because you are buying back time 
at your rate. So for example, this is why it's crucial. If you can get to a number, figure out what your hourly rate is. Let's say your hourly rate, Stephen, is $100 an hour. That's what you make. And in, and in business, you be, should be making more than that, but let's just use that easy number. Um, you make in me Amazon feel business, most people should be making more than My $100 rate is an hour that. <laughs> in an Amazon business. Um, but whatever it is, it doesn't matter. So $100 an hour is your hourly rate. And you know, you've been on Upwork, you've seen the sites, you, you know that you can hire a VA to do this job for 10. Well, all right, would you rather spend 10 or 100? It's a no brainer. You know, you're going to pick the $10 one. And that VA is going to get to a point where they're going to be able to do it better and faster than you anyway. And that, for, so you are, it's an investment and it will pay back big time in not only just the mental space, but now you're like, okay, gosh, that freed up that hour. Every single day, I don't have to do that task. What am I going to do in that hour? That could be, you're going to go hang out with your family and, and chill. Or it could be, I'm going to focus on that thing that has been put on the back burner that I know is going to grow my business. I just haven't had the time to do because I'm doing this thing. It's making me money right now. So I think this is a big stumbling block too, is, is that concept. And the, the idea of getting your time back, it is mm -hmm. kind of an, an odd concept, especially if you never hired before you go, well, I can do it. And, and like sure. you said, the, the small jobs add up, but mm -hmm. if you could build a system and offload that, then you get your time back. Right. It's a, it's an interesting shift for me when I was mm -hmm. being a, a solo entrepreneur, I guess the journey is you're a solo entrepreneur. Then if you want to go on to the next and you are feeling frowns and you want to hire, you get into this messy middle. And I think everybody's messy mm -hmm. middle is a little different. Yeah. I've gone in and out of this messy middle, but I think sure. the getting out of that is your groove. Part of that is learning, educating, taking on these new concepts. Hiring somebody is a weird mental shift. Sure. I think we should be talking more about outsourcing on this podcast and even running down examples because you said, oh, a VA might not be able to do your podcast. This is true. They might not be able to be the person on camera, but they can do the editing. They can do the thumbnail. They Absolutely. can do- any of the transcripts, the copy for chopping it up, using it as marketing material. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of mm -hmm. tasks where you go, oh, I have to produce the podcast. I got to do all these things. I think there yeah. are little tasks in there that can be mm -hmm. offloaded to a VA. Oh, sure. For sure. I think there's a lot of jobs like that where someone assumes I have to do all of this. The marketing, mm -hmm. I have to do all of this. But I think if we break it down to what does marketing mean? Here are the jobs that you might have to do because it's yep. your face, it's your business, but here are all the little tasks that can be handed off. And yep. I think it's very interesting to hear you say, there's a task that I had that I think a VA can do. And I've been sitting on this for a couple of months, but at least yeah. something triggered where this is a task that needs to be handed off for to a VA and you eventually did it. Whereas before, I think I, there's a lot of tasks that I just don't know can be handed off to a VA. So I never get around to it. So the yep. difference between knowing and not knowing, I think is a big aha moment, but I would almost yep. be interested too, is what was the task that, have there been other things like that where there's a task where oh, you're like, yeah. I know for sure this needs to get handed off and it just takes you a long time. Yeah. What do you think is holding you back from handing that off? Yeah, real quick before I get to that, we need to do an episode about just the busting the fears that people have about hiring. Ooh. One would be like, um, gosh, it's going to cost me 200 a month, 400 a month to have this outsourced or even, you know, I'm just nervous about what holds people back from. Yeah, so that one was a big one. Um, how to hire a VA, where to find them, how to, all the hiring process can be scary. It's not really, especially if you use a service. And then the third <laughs> might be is like, I'm committing to this person. Like I'm hiring a person. What if it doesn't work out? I'll bust that one real quick for you guys is that you literally can go into a relationship. If Steven was my potential VA and, and I, I really like him, I want to hire him. I could say, Steven, look, I'm growing my business. I've only been in business for two years and I don't know if this is going to work out. This is honestly, it's a little scary for me, but I, I like you. I know you can do this job. Let's do a trial run here for, let's make it like a probationary period for like 30 days. And we're kind of both te testing each other out. And if you don't like it for whatever reason, this isn't, you don't like, feel like I'm a fit. Or if I don't feel like this, I just, you set it up in advance so that if you decide, you know what, this is just not working. You, you're not kind of, you're not necessarily breaking his heart because you've already told him in advance. You're just kind of testing this thing out. This is new. Um, and especially if you go through a service, you know that, and don't worry about it because in our, in the service that we provide, we're going to be able to, that VA is going to get another job. So it's not like you're putting them out on the street and they're going to be trying to feed their family. They're going to be out begging. That's totally not the case. There's way more, there, there's just plenty of people that need those VAs. So 
take that pressure off you. So we'll do, we need to do an episode about the fears that people think about with the VA and we'll get rid of them. Okay. What was your question about the messy middle? You hitting a point now oh, where yeah, I feel yeah. like you're, you're in your groove. You had a, something come up where you identified, I need a VA, but it just yeah. took you time. The transition from, I know now that I need a VA, but didn't, but you are in a spot where you can identify that quickly that you need a VA. Uh -huh. What holds you back oh, as somebody yeah. that I feel is an unfrazzled entrepreneur, you're in your groove, but even yeah. you linger with this sometimes where it's, I need to hire this out, but it's taking time. What is that? And does that happen? Yeah, often? for me, it was, um, it was silly. Um, it's just not, um, I didn't know who the VA was going to be. I may mean, have a whole team of VAs, but I didn't want to, I didn't want one of my current team members to have to do this. I wanted somebody new because they're already pretty busy. And so I was like, I don't know who that new person is. And so that was a big part of it. And it was, again, the biggest part of it was just one of the, it's one of those tasks that just does not take very long and doesn't happen every day. And so I'd be like, well, next time I'll outsource it. Oh, the next time I'll outsource it. This will take me two minutes to do. And it literally is a two minute task. Um, so I just kept kicking it, kicking that can down the road. Um, but I was like this week, I'm sick of this. I'm not doing this. I knew the person that could do this. And I asked her, could you handle this for me? Like, absolutely done. And, uh, <laughs> I, I should have done a long time ago, but we're not perfect. You know, we're, you know, it was just not one of those things that was super critical to my business, but it was pain something point. I just knew that was holding me back from getting to my goal of always, you know, trying to be in the zone of the zone of genius most of the time. Yeah. I guess that desired zone is a, it's almost like a flow state. You're not in it all the time, right. but the thrive is to get in there as much as you can. There are going to be certain mm -hmm. things like my wife has a honeydew list and every once yeah. in a while, I'm like, I, I don't want to <laughs> switch yeah, this you plug from that too. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's something so minute that I'm just like, okay, I'll do it. But it is at least a you have eye on the prize and you're moving towards that. And right. I think just seeing you also struggle with this at a certain point, there, there is a point where I can go, okay, I'm, I am an unfrazzled entrepreneur, mm -hmm. but there will be things that will try to take me out or get me out of my groove. Mm -hmm. I just have to continue to remember what is my desired zone mm -hmm. and how do I, what is the solution to this pain point that I currently have? That's a new yeah. pain point. Cause we're all learning in this process that will get me to back into my desired zone. Yep. Absolutely. It's good. So I think this is a great episode. I feel last episode, if you're like me and in this messy middle, if you want to go back and listen to our journeys getting started, there's a lot of aha moments in that podcast. I think that might help you identify where you're at on this journey a little bit more, find out if you're in the messy middle, if you're just getting started and start thinking about, oh, it's not just a, I'm an entrepreneur and I have my business up and rocking right away. There's a lot of transitions in this road. Ryan's story was interesting to me because he started as in the political field, then he went to furniture, which seems a little odd. Then he went into the next thing. It's like, right. I think everybody's journey is like that. It's like, you kind of start over here and then you start working towards what your passion is. And this mm -hmm. identifying your desired zone, I think is the next piece of understanding yeah. how to become an unfrazzled entrepreneur. Yep. See you guys in the next episode. <laughs> you got the blue hat today. I just love how many that. different hats you how many different colors do you got there i like that four i have a white and blue a black <laughs> and then i have the blue dot the red dot and then i try to pair it up with that was the other thing my wife was nice. like you need to look how professional eyes you think i fall she was like okay well, but <laughs> i need to put like a bird with the wing in the background of infrazzle entrepreneur like up in the sky i don't know maybe not. that's what i was telling him like how can we sprinkle in the can actual, tie in it uh, tie it in somehow like we had some ideas being... but we couldn't quite yeah. rank because the red almost clashes so we were just trying yes. to think of it okay